Hello everyone, this is R.S. Miller at TheEndTimeNews.org and today is July 25th, 2012. This video has a tendency to be just a little bit long, so I'm simply going to say this first. We are living in the last days. The signs of the times are all around us, and Bible prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. As a firm believer in the pre-tribulation rapture, that time is rapidly approaching and we need to be ready, otherwise we will be left behind. Although no one knows the day or the hour, we will know when it is near, even at the doors. Are you saved? Follow the link below and pray the prayer of salvation with a sincere heart and you will be saved. It is my prayer that God bless each and every one of you with ears to hear, eyes to see, and our heart to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to read to you guys some of the news emails that I received since um, about June 20th of this year. And it says, Australia, mystery illness affecting galas, birds suddenly unable to fly. Canada, large number of dead fish found at Buffalo Pound Lake, Saskatchewan. Another in Canada, hundreds of dead fish found in Red Creek, Red Hill Creek, Ontario. In Florida, at least 75 dead seabirds found the long stretch of Daytona Beach. In Texas, mysterious mass death of cattle prompts federal investigation. In Australia, mystery turtle death stumped scientists in North Queensland goes on to say the mysterious uh, death of 22 green turtles, a protected species, is puzzling experts in North Queensland. The experts have not ruled out poisoning and even drowning as a cause. In Hawaii, avian botulism outbreak kills at least 67 birds. In Georgia, Biologists investigate cause of thousands of dead fish on Carter's Lake. Highly pathogenic, pathogenic H7N3 outbreak in Mexico, largest in nearly 20 years, millions of chickens could be called. Livestock disease with 86% mortality called worst epidemic in a decade. 1.6 million goats and sheep at risk. Outbreak of American fowl brood disease reported in honeybee colonies in Scotland. Large quantities of dead fish have been seen flowing downstream all day. That's in Ireland. Hundreds of dead fish line the banks of Pottersburg Creek, Ontario. Dozens of geese, ducks found dead in Sandusky, Ohio. Wildlife officials are doing tests on waterfowl carcasses and water samples in an effort to determine what killed more than 50 geese and ducks at a state care facility for veterans in northern Ohio. Unknown disease kills 60 children in Cambodia. Highly contaminated fish detected in Fukushima rivers and lakes up to 25 times the legal limit. Florida Fish and Wildlife Con Conservation Commission study Lake Buffum catfish die-off near Fort Meade. Thousands of fish found dead in Illinois, Missouri, Georgia, and South Carolina. High temperatures are to blame. Hundreds of thousands of dead fish found at Lake Wichita in Texas. Concerns grow over H1N1 outbreak in Bolivia. Anthrax speared in mass bison kill in Northwest Territories in Canada. Thousands of fish found dead along the James River as far as the eye can see. Now that's in, uh, let's see, where's that at? That's in North Dakota. In Arizona, thousands of fish found dead along 20-mile stretch of the Salt River. Thousands of dead fish found at Silver Lake in Delaware. In California, 
you have starving pelicans turning up on Bay Area beaches. Now, I would just you know, wonder what's causing these birds to die of starvation. Is it a lack of food in the water? Perhaps, you know, uh, fish being killed off by radiation? Or perhaps radiation itself is causing their digestive system to malfunction, and in which case they may starve to death. Then we have uh, fish kill much larger than initial estimates. Everything in the area is dead. That's in Canada. Out of whack, corn is dying all over America. Heat wave kills thousands of fish in Minnesota lakes. Feds declare drought emergency across 1,000 counties. Worst crop conditions in 24 years. 500 dead penguins wash up on beaches in Brazil. China on alert as disease outbreak kills 112 in June. Thousands of small fish found dead in Kasumi River, Tokyo. BP oil spill partially to blame for high dolphin deaths in the Gulf of Mexico. Cholera outbreak in West Africa leaves 62 dead in one month. Thousands of dead fish litter of Volusia speech as far as the eye could see. That's in Florida. Thousands of dead fish wash ashore on Pigeon Lake in Alberta. In India, Wildlife Department mystified as dozens of peacocks drop dead. In Maryland, thousands of dead fish wash up in Piney Point. In California, thousands of dead fish spotted around Lake Elsinore. And in Kenya, mass vaccination plan after outbreak kills more than 1,300 animals. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're all entitled to believe what it is that we choose to believe. We can believe what they tell us, you know, with some of these uh, lame excuses such as birds that have overeaten themselves to death. Uh, we can believe uh, that it's the drought that's causing all of this, like the fish dying, uh, lack of water, lack of oxygenation, and that may be part of the problem. But then we can also believe the prophecy of Hosea in chapter 4. And the Lord says, For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy, or knowledge of God in the land, by swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break all restraint, with bloodshed after bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away, with the beast of the field, and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Now here's an interesting article discovered by uh, Mr. Comet and um, it says that you know 97% of Greenland's ice is melted and here you can see a couple of satellite photos you know one here and one here and uh, there's virtually no ice 97% only three more percent makes a hundred I guess that's ice right there and maybe this right here 97%. That's a lot. But anyways, I'll put a link to this article in the box below and you guys can come up here and check it out. Now, I've included a video about Fukushima and uh, it's a lot more catastrophic than what we've been led to believe. Uh, the video itself is about an hour long and I'm not playing all of that, but about 15, 16 minutes of it. But I will put a link in the box below so that you guys can go up there and watch it in its entirety. Okay, take care. Future medical report, and of course, uh, we have Christina Consola. She was on last week, and uh, I guess your website is FukushimaFacts.com. FukushimaFacts.com. 
and you have a, a show called Nuked Radio. That's a pretty good term, Nuked Radio. That's pretty uh, in your face, Nuked Radio. And I guess since you were on last week, uh, Christina, you had a number, quite a few new uh, people that joined your blogs, etc. Uh, you know, people need to check out the facts. As they tell repeatedly, uh, the Nutra Medical Report Clay and Iron Show is not a cult. We are not conspiracy theorists. We are conspiracy scientists. And the first conspiracy is the silence by the media, the inaction by so-called government and or corporate agencies. This is not a theory. Theory is something that has a number of suspicions which you have to go test the facts. But once you have the facts, it's no longer a theory. So when we're talking about things like the effects of radiation, the inaction by not only the government but the IAEA, the United Nations, the United States, Obama's prancing around preparing for the next election, and no one's doing anything about Fukushima. Nobody's doing anything about being assaulted with radiation. And even Senator Wyden's office has been completely... Uh, I've been told, if you're not an Oregon resident, by the way, my son is, and I'll have him contact them, but they're not responding to me at all now for over a month. I recently, though, contacted Senator Dianne Feinstein's office, and I expect to hear something back. Their supposed expert in nuclear safety basically knows very little. And so what I see is incompetence and uh, rookies that really are putting the public in danger because they're not acquiring data, they're not making decisions, and they're not op operating to apply the pressure they could op apply pressure to actually have an action plan to deal with either remediating the site over at Fukushima, advising people of the dangers of radiation, and even collecting data either through use of these hundreds of thousands of drones they have that could have radiation detectors, or putting them in commercial airliners. But of course, we know that our airline uh, pilots and stewards and stewardesses are exposed to radiation when they fly at higher altitudes. But what about if you fly through a radiation plume there's 20 or 30,000 times more radiation than the background level of cosmic background radiation, x-rays, etc., just for flying at a higher altitude. We want to know where these plumes are. Uh, we, I call this whole thing the uh, Fukushima plume gate, and uh, we're not getting any information, and the more we push, in fact, it's a bigger conspiracy, the conspiracy of silence. The latest, of course, is that they're trying to remove some one-third of the fuel rods that are newer, which are more likely to go critical from Fukushima cooling pool 4, because if this plant decides to blow, which is likely to happen if the fuel seals break in that pool, no amount of pumps or assist pumps, which are kind of being held together by bailing wire and chewing gum, are going to prevent the fuel rod assemblies from blowing. And there's 1,535 of them uh, likely to create a radiation cloud, according uh, to some of the top experts, of 30 to 100 times more radiation uh, than last year released if only 10% of those fuel rod assemblies go. So the situation is dire, and we have basically no action whatsoever. And that, is, that, is, that itself is a very major story that the world powers, Japanese government lying and even reburning trash that they average from highly radioactive trash to normal trash, is a crime of biblical proportions against the population of Earth in every biosphere on the planet. Not just the Northern Hemisphere. You can't be too smug in the Southern Hemisphere because you will eventually get this radiation, although it will take a while. Uh, Christina, tell us what you're hearing lately, because we've got a lot of issues to cover today. Well, I've, I've been reading about the, um, the conspiracy of the lead vests going on at TEPCO and, and other places uh, covering their dosimeters. Yeah, that's a really important thing. We had some good jokes on the uh, before the show today about covering dosimeters. Like, uh, yeah, tell us about those, because this is a kind of like uh, otherworldly that, you know, people would use their lead vests to actually cover their dosimeter so they get artificially low readings for the workers and also the radiation readings on the site. And, and why this is so significant is because after a, a certain amount of exposure, these workers won't be allowed to work on the site, and they're already having trouble finding people to work there. When you look at the long-term projections for you know, 30 to 40 to 100 years to decommission the plan if it's even possible, um, you know, where are they going to get people to work there? Well, there's only six, there's 16 people that know the plan mm -hmm. forward and backward. If they lose those people, they can't go and requisition people from other places that know the plan. And the other workers, a lot of them are being sent there literally by the uh, Yakuza, the Japanese form of the mafia, to work out yeah. their debt, and they're completely brain brainless and don't have any idea what they're doing. Even if you were highly motivated and knew the plant backwards, if you go to these really heavily radioactive areas, 
you simply get so much radiation, you're a bumbling, drooling idiot by the time you get into these high radioactive zones. So even if you had a plan and we're going to do something in 10 or 20 or 30 or 60 minutes, you may well be so radioactive you can't even think straight by the time you get to where you're supposed to do what you're going to do. Um, I, I saw a video of the first two rods that were removed from Reactor 4 last week where the workers are actually wiping the rods off of the cloth by hand. Wiping off rods with the cloth. Try to reduce the, uh, the external, you know, the exposure coming off the rod. I don't think that a little cap. cloth is going to stop gamma rays, do you? No. No. Gamma rays and high energy neutron, high energy uh, neutrons that are coming off if there's any criticality, high energy electrons coming out of the from beta particle emissions, going to do zip. It may stop alpha particle emissions, but that's it. Yeah, it's a problem. I feel it terrible is. for those people. Um, you know, when, Ru when this happened in Russia, they uh, sent buses out to take 30,000 miners out of the town to get them to dig under the plant, and it, they didn't really have a choice. They were put on the bus and, and taken there, but, I mean, they, they dealt with it the way it needed to be dealt with. Well, they can do tunneling machines. If they had a tunneling machine, and if they also created uh, took uh, created containers and lined them with depleted uranium, do you lining of containers snapped together like a red Lego set would allow you to block the neutron flux that could cause damage and the gamma rays? and they can have workers walk in and out and have much less exposure. Uh, we also have a range of nutraceuticals that they could take along with the proper rad suits, which have been designed by the Russians. They could significantly reduce the radiation exposure, but we don't have that. We don't also have cable robots, which are robots run on cables, or what's called radiation-resistant robots with IEEE-Promium ferromagnetic chips that were designed for deep space and used against EMP war warfare. But the government doesn't want to come clean to the fact that they have radiation-resistant electronic circuits and ICs that are otherwise fried by gamma rays and neutrons. They're not, uh, what we're seeing is absolutely no action. Nobody's hauling anything out of Warehouse 13. And uh, if anything goes, and we're talking about multiple things could go, reactor one, two, three, cooling pool four, if anything goes and the site becomes, un, uh, how can I say, completely unserviceable, which right now, they're, what their primary thing they do in the weekend is, believe it or not, go home. They go home. They don't do anything. They go home. There's nobody doing anything. There's nobody tunneling under to create a corium catcher. Nobody building a seawall. Nobody putting Kevlar spider silk tents over it. Nobody setting up an air filtration system to convert the radioactive dust and nanoparticles into a solid waste. Nobody transporting the highly radioactive water in double hull ships to a place where it can be properly converted. Basically, they're dumping thousands of tons of radioactive water every day. 83% plus of the radiation is being dumped out in the ocean or in the air and it's venting eastward toward us and circulating the planet many, many times before it becomes salted in the oceans around the world through the black or Humboldt current, uh, which it carries around the world. So it takes two and a half years to completely circulate the planet. So in one year and a couple of months, it will have circulated through the oceanographic currents but the jet stream and the other currents have been carrying around the world many, many times. So uh, we're going to have background radiation, literally cesium, strontium, and heavy isotopes everywhere on the planet. Um, that's what's so disturbing about this is people don't get it that we're already into the biological effects of a World War III scenario without the cities on fire. Right. Yeah, we are under nuclear attack. Yeah, we're and we don't have... We're learning every day about how these isotopes behave um, out, outside of the reactors. In fact, uh, they, they had published some data a few months back about it, the RADs being re-released as the ground heats up just from the, the sun, um, yes. you know, after rain, uh, re-releasing. Um, plus, you know. plus the, plus the uh, burn, if you have fires, like the fires from the uh, in Arizona and New Mexico after the above-ground testing released radiation that was stored there 30, 40, 50 years ago from above-ground nuclear testing. Welcome back, and we're joined by Christina Consolo. Her website is FukushimaFacts.com. You have a lot of links from that, including your blogs, etc., YouTube channel. Um, we've got a lot of uh, points to cover today, Christina. I'd like you to kind of expand on some of these. Uh, the uh, 
Uh, first one, of course, was the fuel rod uh, removal is underway over at TEPCO. I believe we're wiping, wiping off the rods by hand, which we talked about. Thyroid numbers in Japan, contamination measured in versus cysts grown in high percentage compared to Nagasaki. So that's an E&E news, and we're going to post those links up. The large number of nuke plants having electrical computer problems in the past week after the sun flares. And uh, Nine Mile Point to New York, uh, Limerick Point, um, uh, the Quad Cities, Illinois, just to name a few, and I think you've expanded that list uh, since then. We know that uh, not only do we have the uh, three different types of, of material that comes from the sun, we have electrons, which come first. Then we have um, neutrons, a neutron flux from the sun, and then we have, of course, the plasma. So there's actually three different phases, and they come in three different waves if you have a coronal mass ejection or a sun, a sunspot or a storm. If it's a geocentric storm in the same directory as Earth, you can have a Carrington. I do mean it is C, not H. It's a Carrington effect, 1859. That can cause some real problems. And the other thing is that sun activity does change the half-life uh, of nuclear reactions and can change the, uh, if you want to call it, the, the nuclear flux uh, reactivity of, of uh, nuclear ions in a unstable or a critical reaction. So... Uh, it can have effect on it. Besides inducing power on the power lines coming from plants, they have to turn down the power output. It can cause station blackout. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that can happen from uh, uh, sunspots that can make nuclear reactors very, very fragile. So um, let's expand on that a bit. You know, that's a, a question that I had posed to several experts on, on, on my show was, the information about the decay rates that had come out in 2010 that was first reported by Purdue and later uh, by Stanford that the uh, sun activity would correlate to a change in decay rate, um, whether or not the sun activity would change or adversely affect the, uh, the contents of nuclear reactors. No one's been able to really answer that for me. Right. Well, it does change the uh, rate of the T1.5. The way it works is this, and Nikola Tesla talked with Marie Curie back in the 1920s on it, and what he basically said was that uh, depending on what's called the time sequence of scalar uh, atomic frequencies, you can actually change what's called the, the uh, if you want to call it the atomic blue that holds together an atom, in a sense, by hitting a certain harmonic frequencies. And in the periodic table of elements, it hit the atomic frequency spectra of a non-radioactive isotope of the elements in the same periodic table, you'll shatter off the radioactive components and cause it to decay at a much more accelerated rate. So he said he could change the T1 the T half or the decay rate. That's pretty significant, whether you're making nuclear bombs or having nuclear reactors, because it does change when there's solar spots, and it occurs even before the, the first wave actually hits. So before the, uh, the electron surge hits the Earth, before the neutrons hit, and before the uh, plasma hits the planet, there's an actual change that can be detected even beforehand, so there's a, a change in the curvature and if you want to call density of the Higgs boson or time space continuum that occurs even before we get hit with the energy of the coronal mass ejection. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and, and I would think that a lot more uh, physicists would, would be concerned about it as well and how it may affect reactor operations. Cause we, what we're seeing is uh, mostly electrical problems that are occurring in a number of plants. There were eight last week, just today. Well, uh, Fermi, Fermi oh. 2, Calvert yeah. Cliff, and Oyster Creek, and, and all these plants that were built in the late 60s, so they're right. very old as well. Plus, the um, fuel rods, as they get old, get yeah, more touchy. They, get more, they go to your scram, exactly. They, also, the fuel rod assemblies get more touchy. In other words, they can go hot real quickly which means it's really hard to keep them cooled down when there's a coronal mass ejection occurring. The other is MOX reactors are hot as Hades. They're basically the real, real touchy. So we have a mixed oxygen fuel plutonium reactor, which can take an old plant and increase its power up by 30 to 40, 50 percent. Those reactors, which are very, in a sense, breeder reactors that generate more plutonium, those are dangerous, and they're also very, very hot. And when you have a station blackout or a surge in power, they can go critical really quickly. Yeah, when you have a, you know, a hot shutdown or a hot standby situation, too, there's still um, xenon gas that's being produced that has to be dealt with. That's another thing that we're seeing. These seals keep failing on plants. Um, Prairie Island had a seal failure today. Um, that's um, high on our list. In fact, we have a web page just for 
Prairie Island nuclear generating station because well, it had, the plants had so many problems. Last week we went over the data with Chris Harris, that's our uh, radio name of Chris Harris, our nuclear expert, last Thursday. And what he said was these tubes at San Onofre vibrate because of the steam generation. There's a basic defect in the design. He added more tubes, and the plant was originally designed for all steam turbines, and there two that they added were $600 million a piece. They vibrated, and they literally banged against each other until they decayed and caused a major, major break in the, the non-radioactive, the radioactive loop for steam. And so it was venting off radioisotopes probably for years. But when they have a hot shutdown, this increases dramatically, and the plant literally burnt out, you know, thousands of tubes. Um, it looks to me like, you know, they're trying to, to rearrange the deck chairs and see if they can get it back activated, but it looks like these steam turbines will have to be pulled and have to be re-engineered completely. Uh, the problem with all these reactors, too, is that all of them are st storing radioactive material on site. Many, many of them have what we call, like the Mark I General Electric reactor, and there's 25 plus in America. And they have done some re-engineering uh, 20 years after they originally installed them in what's called the Taurus for getting venting off hydrogen. Uh, they did a faux engineering in Japan, which meant they had an argument between two groups of engineers knowing that there was a faux engineering, which was a false engineering, so it couldn't handle the pressures of releasing the hydrogen because they thought it would cause a hydrogen-generated explosion, which could also compress the corium and cause a nuclear reaction or an explosion, a nuclear explosion. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, in reactor number one, which is right over a fault line, Reactor 1 in Japan actually exploded because it went critical. They had, they still have neutron beams coming from Reactor 1 that you can see from space 35, 40 miles away. And the, especially at sundown, you see these blue beams of neutron jetting through the air, creating uh, nitrogen-generated uh, blue light when the mm -hmm. neutrons hit the nitrogen. So um, it tells me that a lot of the people that are involved with this use what I call very sharp engineering pencils, and they have a very low on what's called their... Uh, uh, their EQ, their ethics quotient. Their ethics quotient is like maybe one or two, just slightly above a bacterium. Uh, they may have a high IQ, but they very have a low EQ.